Everyone, thank you for still staying here. I know it's getting pretty late, but we appreciate that you're still here. I know that we have many 503B outsourcing facilities that are on the call today, but can I get a show of hands of if there's any in this room? Any representatives? All right, well, I hope that this is helpful, at least for the people on the phone. Um, so today, Sujin and I are going to be going through um, various things regarding 503B outsourcing product reporting, specifically We'll talk about the relevant um, regulations governing 503B product reporting and what exactly 503B product reporting is. We will also proceed and provide you with a live demonstration on how to even initiate a 503B product report. And finally, at the conclusion of the presentation, we will return back to the slides and go through some frequently asked questions. and provide you with some important resources that we think that you might find helpful, especially with the upcoming December product report. So as many of you already know, in 2013, the Drug Quality and Security Act created a new section, Section 503B. And under Section 503B, it essentially created a new business entity, the outsourcing facility. Section 503B defines an outsourcing facility as a facility um, at one geographic location or address who is engaged in the compounding of sterile drug, pro drug products, who is required to register with the FDA and comply with various requirements outlined under Section 503B. So upon initial registration, an outsourcing facility is required to submit an initial product report. Um, for, and that product report includes all drugs compounded during the previous six months. Thereafter, an outsourcing facility is required to submit a product report biannually, once in June and the second one in December. The June product report includes all drugs compounded um, during the months spanning from December 1st to May 31st, and the December product report covers all drugs compounded during the months from June 1st to November 30th. So, Please keep in mind of specifically the December product report since that product reporting period is right around the corner. So this, is, um, this also essentially means that if you are a outsourcing facility who initially uh, submits a product report, for example, on May 31st, that's your first one, that means that even for the June product report, which begins on the next day, you are still required to again submit another product report spanning for the for the June product reporting period and then again in December. So just keep that in mind. Now before going into the live demonstration, I want to go through some important tips or hints that we think that we, you might find useful in order to um, eliminate any potential errors that you may encounter or difficulties that you may encounter as you begin thinking about the December product reporting period. Now, while an NDC number is not required to be assigned to a final compounded drug, if a facility does decide to um, assign an NDC number to a finished drug, it's important to keep in mind that we only accept uh, NDC numbers in a 10-digit, three-segment format. If you try to submit or if you try to assign an 11-digit um, NDC number, that will not pass validation. Also, particularly important for you larger outsourcing facilities that compound hundreds or potentially even thousands of drugs, this will help you out um, in terms of um, decreasing the time when you do these submissions. One single SPL file can include multiple drugs if it, if it contains, if those drugs contain the same active ingredient but different strengths. Now, we will go into this in a little bit more detail when we go through the live demonstration, but this is very easy to do. Once you um, create an initial SPL file for a particular drug, all you would have to do is save that, return back to the home page, and continuing adding um, additional products with different drug, uh, strength formulations. Now, this next tip is very important. We've received a lot of questions from outsourcing facilities over the year who have had a lot of difficulties um, regarding the source NDC requirement. The source NDC number for each active ingredient is a required field in a product report submission. So the, as we've already discussed throughout this entire conference, um, 
Cedar Direct has a lot of automatic validation. So if you fail to include a source NDC number for a particular ingredient, it will not pass validation. So with a 30-day time, and this brings me to the next point, with a 30-day time period during June and December, especially if you're unfamiliar with Cedar Direct, but hopefully you're not after spending five hours here today with us, um, but especially if you're new to the system and if you have a large quantity of drugs to um, submit with, you know, with the associated source NDC numbers, please prepare ahead of time. I cannot emphasize this enough. In order to help you guys out with source NDC numbers, um, especially, we have created a downloadable data file that includes um, a list of all of all listed unfinished drug products. So use this at your disposal, but please, when you submit your product reports, please make sure that that source NDC number has been properly listed to us, because if it's not, it will not pass validation. And finally, this is a new update from last year, actually, when we presented um, for regarding product reporting. We have, we have created a new ingredient type code for you outsourcing facilities who use dietary supplements as an active ingredient. So keep in mind of this new update. This is a new feature that was not available to you when we presented last year. And finally, as all of you already have at your disposal, because we've um, given you guys hard copies, if you have, if you have any additional questions or um, need a quick location to, um, you know, review outsourcing facility information or to gather additional resources, please refer to the eDuralist toolkit, and specifically on page 15 of the, of the eDuralist toolkit, which uh, discusses more, which includes more information about 503B outsourcing facilities. And now I will transition over to Sujin, who will provide you with a live demonstration of how to initiate a product report. Movie playing back there. I don't know if you guys can hear. <laughs> They're giving me a grand um, entrance. Um, so I was really hoping that I won't be the last presenter to do the live demonstration today, since everyone's been sitting here for five plus hours, um, whether you're in, in person or online. Um, I feel like you guys are all theater direct experts now. So, um, but I'm here. And I, I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so I'm here today go over the live demonstration portion of 503B product reporting. And I'm going to try to make this as quickly and painless as possible, since I am the last presenter to do the live demo today. So here we are. Again, this is FDA Cedar Direct Electronic Submissions Portal. And I am going to quickly sign in using my username and password, hopefully my password it's going to work. Of course not. Oh, joy of live demonstration. Julian, can I use your password? Is that OK? Okay, here we are, finally. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks, Julian, for letting me use your username and password. 
Um, so in order to start your product reporting submission, you're going to select product listing and certification um, option underneath submissions. And then we'll click on create new or upload file. Um, and then you have two options to choose from. You can either create a new product reporting using a blank form, or if you have previously saved your product reporting SPL using different application, you're more than welcome to import that existing file using the second option. But for the purpose of my presentation today, I am going to choose the first option and by using a, a blank form. And then the second um, item you have to select is the SPL's document type. And here you're going to select from drop down menu human compounding drug label and click continue. Here's the header details information that you've seen um, pretty much all day today. Uh, one thing that I want to bring to your uh, attention is this reporting period. This is something that's only specific to the 503B product reporting submission. So if you are a brand new uh, registered 503B outsourcing facility, not only, and once you register, you are also required to submit an initial report to us. In that case, you will select this initial reporting period. We do have, as Lisette mentioned, we have December reporting period coming up starting December 1st. So I'm going to select 2018, the second reporting period. And then uh, you, the next section is the labeler detail information. Here you'll, you will enter the labeler's name as well as the labeler's nine-digit uh, dunce number. So I'm going to just make up the labeler, Park Compounding Inc., and enter the dunce number. Next section is the establishment information. Here I'm going to add establishment name and the DUNS number. And for 503B product reporting, um, the labeler name and also the establishment name usually are the same. So I'm going to enter the establishment information and the appropriate DUNS number. And once you're done entering establishment information, you can go ahead and save that info. And you can see the labeler's information and establishment information appear on your SPL. The last part of your SPL, which is actually the most extensive part, is the product section. So the agency requires all registered 503B facilities to identify whether they have compounded products within that uh, specific reporting period. So even if a, an outsourcing facility have not produced any drug products, we, need, we are requiring um, them to report that to us. So if you are a outsourcing facility and you did not produce any drug products for the, five, for the December reporting period, you still have to select from this drop-down menu where it asks you, do you have any products to report? Just simply click No, and you can go up and submit that SPL to us. Now, if you do have products to report for December reporting period, then you will select Yes and click on Add Products and start adding the products that you, are, you have compounded in previous six months. So this also, once again, looks a lot like the drug listing SPL uh, that Julian went over. Uh, one thing that you'll notice here is that the NDC, NDC product code for product reporting is not a required field. So outsourcing facilities are not required to assign an NDC number to their final compounded products. Um, but if they have assigned an NDC number, then they can um, submit that NDC number to us. How, and, and once again, the NDC number has to be in 10-digit format. So here, I'm just going to enter NDC product code. It's a made-up number for my compounded product. And next is the proprietary name and the non-proprietary name. For proprietary name, we really just recommend that you simply use the non-proprietary name or include the active ingredients as your as, um, proprietary name. So for my presentation, I am going to use 
acyclovir and lidocaine ointment as one of my examples. So I enter that information under proprietary name. And then under non-proprietary name, I have to enter acyclovir 5% and lidocaine 1% ointment. Now, if the product that you're reporting out is a scheduled or controlled substance, then you can choose the uh, appropriate designation, DEA designation for your product. Um, since my product is non-scheduled product, I will leave it blank. Next section is dosage form. So you select the dosage form option from the drop-down menu. My product is an ointment. So select ointment under dosage form. Route of administration, you have a whole lot of um, options to choose from. For my product, it is a topical product. But if you have a product that can be possibly used orally or intravenously, you can select more than one um, route of administration. So select topical, highlight that item, and then move it over to the right side column. Next, under marketing details, uh, marketing category has been already pre-selected for you for uh, product reporting. So everything else is grayed out, so you don't have to do anything to that. Just leave it the way it is. Next section here is the ingredients. And this is where you include all the active ingredients for your product that you compounded. And it was discussed earlier by Julian, once again, um, during the drug listing demonstration, that the strength of a drug um, product is represented as a ratio. So that's a numerator over denominator. So it is the same case with, uh, with 503B product reporting. So I'm going to click on Add Ingredients. And for my 5% acyclovir, the denominator strength is 1 gram. And then under type, and Julian had gone over this also. And then just to uh, mention what Lizette had mentioned earlier about the um, dietary supplement ingredient type, this is where it is. So for this product, it's an active ingredient. Ingredient is basis of strength. And next item, which is an ingredient uni name, you can just type in the active ingredient and, and pick from the drop down menu. Or if you click on this help text, you can go to the hyperlink here, which will lead you to the substance registration system, and you can search for the active ingre ingredient Unicode. Okay. And the strength of acyclovir is 50 milligrams per gram to make 5%. And moiety same as ingredient. Now the next part, which is probably the most important part, is entering the source NDC. So um, you must enter the NDC product code of the bulk or the finished drug product that you use to compound your products. Um, it is, like Lisette had mentioned earlier, the most, um, the most common question and concerns that we received in the past few years. And we continue to receive this question. So it is very important that you uh, check to make sure that the source that you're utilizing to compound your products are properly listed with FDA. And we do have that um, unfinished drug uh, product, um, the downloadable file available for you on the NDC directory so that you can go in and verify to make sure that the drug you're utilizing is properly listed with us. Because I mean, as we all mentioned before, um, all, your, all the SPLs uh, go through um, extensive validation um, process. And if your source NDC is not properly listed, then it will not pass validation. And you won't be able to submit this particular product uh, in your product reporting for that reporting period. So I looked up an um, bulk a cycle of your um, listing, and this one was properly listed. So I'm going to enter that NDC number. 
under source and DC. And once you have done this, you can save the ingredient. And you can move on to adding your next ingredient for your compounded product. And I'm going to just go ahead and just quickly enter the lidocaine one here as well, since this product has two active ingredients. Everything is pretty much the same. It is a 1% um, lidocaine, so strength is 10 milligrams per gram. I'm also going to enter the um, properly listed NDC number for lidocaine as well and save that ingredient information. Now you, when you go to the bottom of the page, you will see that there are two active ingredients listed for this product. Now the next two sections, the product image and characteristics, are optional for 503B product reporting submission, so I'm going to skip those for now. Um, and the final section is the packaging information. So in order to add packaging, you click on Add Package. And if you have assigned an NDC number to your final product, then you need to enter the full 10-digit NDC under Package NDC here. So I'm going to enter in my made-up NDC number for my product. And for package type, um, my ointment will be in a tube and will be in a 5-gram tube. And the last thing is the number of units produced. So this is the number of units produced for, during that reporting period. So I'm going to say I made 25,000 units of 5-gram acyclovir lidocaine 5%, 1% too. And once I'm done, I can save this package information. And if you go to the bottom, you'll see the packaging information has been added to my SPL. And I'm going to save this product. And now I am ready for submission. Or if you have other products to add to this SPL for, the, uh, for this reporting period, you can go ahead and start adding the other products as well. Now finally, before um, I move on to some of the Q&A, uh, uh, Q uh, frequently asked questions in other slides. I want to go over the content of labeling section of 503B product reporting. It is not a requirement for 503B um, outsourcing facilities to include this information. However, the agency highly, highly recommends that at minimum a principal display panel or a carton label for the product um, to be, the image to be uploaded and embedded into SPL. So I'm going to quickly go over this. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have the content of labeling tab. And click on that and go to Add Sections. And under Section Type, go down to Package Label Principal Display Panel. And you can choose an effective date of today. Um, and you can upload an image for your product, and I have I'm going to upload my image here, and here is the image of pill bottles that I selected. And once your image has been successfully uploaded, under contents, you're going to click on this insert an image icon to embed this image into your SPL. So you click on that, select the image name, and give it a title, and select OK. And now you have this uh, principal display panel embedded in your SPL, and save this section. Oops, we're going to return back to the SPL. And now this is ready for submission. Now this actually concludes the live demonstration portion of the 503B product reporting SPL. 
Um, and now we're going to go to some FAQs and some helpful resources. I'm not going to go through all of the FAQs, but these are the so next six slides or so are some of the FAQs that we compiled um, during maybe last two, three years or so. Um, so the first one is what can be included in one of one product report SPL. Um, I think we went over this already. It could be multiple strengths, multiple package sizes, and multiple source NDCs. And what is FDA standard for NDC number? I think we should all get 100% on this, 10-digit, three-segmented, hyphenated NDC. Why should I save SPL files? Um, it really is to save time for the future, for next time you have to submit a product reporting so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you submit an SPL. Here are the required items for um, product report. We went over this already as well. Um, during each reporting period, what time frame should, should the reports cover? Lisette went over this. Um, so for upcoming December reporting period, which begins December 1st and um, ends December 31st, um, you need to submit products produced during the past uh, six months period. Um, if I did not compound any drug products in pro previous six months, do I have to submit a product report? Yes, you do. You just have to click uh, when they ask the answer, to, have you produced any drug products? You just say no and submit that SPL to us. What information from my product report will be published? Here are the list of items that are currently being published on our website. And under related resources, we have um, provided some links, um, helpful links to guidance, as well as the 503B compounding dashboard where you can find currently uh, registered 503B facilities. Um, the, here, this link, NDC directory, is where you can find that downloadable file we talked about of unfinished drugs, so you can verify the source NDC number. Um, and the publication of product reporting is where you'll find the products that we have published, um, I think as of September 13th. Um, that was our last updated um, publication of product reporting. Um, here's my final slide. Here's our contact information, whether you have questions about drug registration listing or CEDAR direct or compounding, you can contact us at these uh, email addresses. And we are done. Oh, I went, too, I'll come, yeah, I went further. <laughs> All right. Nope, nope. And we'll go ahead and start our Q&A. Again, here, if you have any questions here in the room, please feel free to line up at the microphones. Otherwise, it looks like Paul's bringing all his questions from online, the stacks and stacks of paper up uh, to the podium with him. So please go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I've been asked to come up here. It'll be easier so the people operating the camera don't have to go back and forth here. Some of these I'll shoot at you. Some of these I'm, I'm going to take for myself. Um, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll take this first one. Um, the question is, oh, let me get my notes straight here. Oh, um, regarding the NDCs for non-drug ingredients, uh, the, uh, it was number 27. I'm just going to read this because it, it's a little different than what was talked about here. We are a repackager of uh, bulk APIs for compounding. Our 503B customers require a listed NDC number for each ingredient uh, in their products. How do we list the NDC number for a non-API when the manufacturer of the product is not registered with uh, Cedar? So just a clarification, um, for 503B, for you outsourcing facilities who are reporting products that don't have an active ingredient per se. You have some sort of dietary supplement like vitamin B injection or something and you're reporting that. Um, we The workaround that uh, Su Jin showed is, is how you should do it. There's a special ingredient type up there. But you don't, uh, if 
I'm, and maybe I'm reading too much into the question, but you don't have to provide a source NDC for every ingredient. You don't have to provide source NDCs for the inactive ingredients. You're only providing them for the source, uh, I'm sorry, for the active ingredients. And if, if your only active ingredient is, is considered or the company is, uh, uh, is treating it as a dietary supplement and does, hasn't listed it and doesn't have an NDC, um, then this is the way to get around it. You identify the product or the ingredient as just ingredient, and then you can get by. Now, just so you know, um, the our Office of Unapproved Drugs, our compounding work group, they still review that data, and if, if they deem that that ingredient should be listed or should have a valid NDC and it's a drug, then it, you know there may be other compliance issues to have to deal with. It, this is a workaround for those few cases where uh, we recognize that um, some products won't have an NDC, um, but it, you shouldn't fall back on that just because you can't get an NDC from the supplier. If your supplier of a product or the manufacturer of that product or the broker or whomever cannot provide an NDC for that product, you may be using a non-compliant product. So please be aware of that. Um, and uh, this next one, I'll shoot to you guys if you want to choose to try and uh, answer it and let me know if you want me to step in. It says, we are a 503B facility and we have three buildings for different purposes. One is a warehouse, one is packing and shipping, and the other is for compounding. How do we list all those buildings under the same SPL? Does it mean we list listed, they shouldn't be using listed for facility. Um, should we register all under the same establishment and how what address they show up? So I'm thinking there are if there are three different buildings, one is the compound or the other two do other facilities, should they should those other facilities be registered as part of the 503B? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll venture, that yeah. Before. What's that? I've never yeah, um, I, that. I'll venture this guess because there's a similar question. I don't know if it's from the same person. Only the, only the compounding facility gets registered under 503B. There might be other buildings, there might be other facilities there. And if they do other uh, operations such as packing or relabeling, repacking, they might be required to register under 510, under normal drug registration and listing, what I call normal. Um, but the five, it, it is my understanding, and if I understand the, the question correctly, only the facility, the address of the facility that's doing the compounding is the one that should be registered as human drug outsourcing facility. Um, here's some questions I know you get, you guys better be able to answer. As you <laughs> okay, can, uh, with only 30 days to uh, create and submit uh, the product reports, can we start creating them now? is yes. <laughs> um, do we have to delete a product uh, after we've submitted it with zero units produced for that six months? Do we have to delete it off no, the No, we don't have to delete, delete that um, specific product. Like for example, if you submitted um, a product for a December reporting period and you produced 100,000 of it, and for next June you didn't produce any of that product, you can just simply update the quantity produced to zero. So you don't ever have to delete anything that you saved in your SPL file. You can just update the volume. This, yes. Um, this is more of a, and I'll direct this to all uh, drug manufacturers as well, because it, it applies to everybody. Um, but it says, can I assign, and it's from a, uh, outsourcing facility, can I assign the same NDC product code to different strengths of the product even though I, I issue the, or I produce the same size package for each? No. A different strength formulation for a given product is considered a different product and requires a different product code for each strength. So yeah, the, the broader implication here is that NDCs for compounded products have to follow the same exact rules 
as the NDC for drug manufacture, drug listing, um, and drug products in that, uh, from drug manufacturers. Anytime the product, the strength, the physical attributes, formulation changes, the NDC product code changes, and then within that, if you have different package presentations, then you only change the package code. Uh, we, uh, and th this goes again to um, uh, not being able to get uh, NDCs from your suppliers and such. We are a repackager of bulk pharmaceuticals for compounding 503B customers. Um, are required to list NDC number for all ingredients in their product, even if the active ingredient is not an API, a non-drug or a dietary supplement. How do we list the NDC? This is more of a repackager question, actually. How do we list the NDC number as the source for a non-drug, a non-API or dietary supplement for our 503B customers when the manufacturer is not registered for, um, with CEDA? And I'll field this. First of all, um, well, a, a manufacturer of a non-drug substance, yes, does not have to register. Um, be sure it is a non-drug uh, substance. Um, as if you are repackaging some sort of bulk of a dietary supplement, um, I, that's a good. That's a really a good question. Yeah. How would you uh, not provide a source? I guess the uh, the idea or the question is, how do you provide a source NDC for that if there is no source NDC? Um, we may have to think about how to get around that. Um, so it depends if your final product is a drug. There you are. Right. The compounded product is a drug, which then goes under the reporting requirement, right? Yeah, so this person is, or this company is repackaging. Yeah, I guess that's true. If, you're repa if your only active ingredient, whatever it is you're repacking, is not a drug because it's only got inactive ingredients, then there's no need to list that. Thank you. But what if you have an active ingredient and you have an inactive or another ingredient that we that is? Um, then I would just non, list the or just the include the active, active ingredient, ingredient and its source. If you have an act a real drug substance and a not drug substance, then just provide the real one as the active ingredient. What do we do if the NDC we use is not recognized by the submission portal system? It is a valid NDC from a valid source. But is not recognized by the system. Um, for this, yeah, if, if the, it's probably yeah. It's if if our system isn't recognizing it, it's not validly listed. It might be uncertified. Um, there might be an error or some other issue with that particular listing. I would say um, for we we can help with that if you send us the NDC in question. We can look it up and tell you what's going on. Um, I would also recommend uh, taking that NDC back to whoever it is that gave you that, and and let them know, hey, there's an issue. Maybe they, maybe the the company whose NDC that is does not know there's an issue with their drug listing. Is there a database where we can see who is listed? Uh, this uh, who is listed as the contact person for label of goods? We're getting into some sort of rounding up some questions from earlier, and I do have a few that I want to go back to. Uh, Contact information for, for label no for, oh. for well yeah so let's go over contact issue for or contact info for 503Bs and then I'll answer. So that if you go to the, the 503B dashboard website, we have included the contact information, um, the name and phone number, address um, um, on that website, so you can contact the firm directly. Right, and then for all labeler codes in general, uh, we don't currently publish contact information that was submitted with the labeler code request. That's not a bad idea. We may want to look into that. Um, for right now, you can, however, look up at least who any particular labeler code is assigned. We have a, a master list, if you will, if you go to the SPL webpage um, and look down the, the left-hand side column of all the links, there's a link called NDC and NHRIC labeler codes. And it's just a, an Excel file, um, and it's got it's in labeler code order, and it has labeler code and name of the company, or the name uh, associated with that labeler code. But it might be worth looking into adding uh, contact information for that. Uh, just to reconfirm for the sentence or Jin, is it necessary to include all inactive ingredients as well? 
in the product report. In active ingredients, um, it's not necessary. You must include, obviously, all of the active ingredients, but inactive ingredients, no. Before I start backing up and trying to get to some of these other questions, um, for, uh, I, I just want to make sure there's no one else here in the room that has 503B questions. Otherwise, we're going to try and make this a bit of a clearinghouse of previous questions. I'll direct some here. I might call in some of the other Durless staffers. Uh, but one last sort of, and if something does pop in mind, please, by all means, step up um, whenever you like. Uh, there was one question since Troy is up here. Uh, I had it here. It was, um, if you have a solid oral, and this is, goes back to drug listing, if you have a solid oral dosage form, that is an oval, you need to include all three dimensions for the size, length, width, height. Um, in other words, three different size inputs. Or do you need to only include one dimension for the size? I think you're only allowed to include one dimension at this time. So, Yeah, so that would be the length. Uh, for an oval, uh, that would be the length of the tablet. Um, this is uh, uh, actually a suggestion, an enhancement, and goes, uh, I'll say, uh, something about it in a second. But it says, when will a REMS SPL template be available in Cedar Direct? Um, REMS, for those who don't know, is a, a, a fairly new SPL submission type. Um, we don't currently have it in Cedar Direct. Uh, you can get it through the Pragmatic X forms. But thank you for the suggestion. We may look into adding that. And, and along those lines, those of you who do uh, are heavy users or even light users of Cedar Direct, if you have any suggestions for enhancements, help us help you. If there's something that you think would be very useful um, and, and make the, the application even more user friendly, by all means, it can't hurt to ask. It may be something that we hadn't thought of before. So we would appreciate any suggestions you might have. Um, this is a good one from earlier uh, regarding listing. Please explain the denominator more completely. So. When we talk about the denominator in the strength of a listing or even in product reporting, what what should the denominator uh, refer to? Anyone want to feel that Julian has been volunteered here? So the denominator. Um, so in Sujin's example, it was the she did an ointment, and so um, five percent ointment translates to 50 milligrams over 1 gram or 1,000 milligrams. So the denominator has to actually match, the uh, unit has to match whatever you're packaging. So if you're packaging a 5 gram tube, you have to use 1 gram. So even, so even though you're doing 50 milligrams over 1,000 milligrams, um, in order to get that validation to pass, you have to use grams, so just translate the grams into, um, the milligrams into grams. So um, 50 milligrams over one gram is 5%. So that's where we actually see a lot of mistakes with regards to uh, the strength conversions when you're converting from percentages. So that's something to be very careful about. Great. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions to that? Uh, here's a quick hitter for OTC drugs, such as hand sanitizers. Do you have to list the manufacturer of the active ingredient, i.e. ethanol? Yes. Yes. All, all uh, establishments involved in the manufacture of the product back to the API must be included in the, in the uh, drug listing. Um, here's a, a good question about the process of delisting. And they use a wonderful verb here, which I'm guilty of. When end marketing a product, <laughs> when adding an end market date to a product, uh, it says we delist the product and it is no longer on daily med. How do customers look up the drug? And then there's a follow up. Do we have to wait a certain amount of time from end marketing to have the product removed from daily med? So just a review of the, well, anybody want to volunteer that? OK. <laughs> I like to talk. Um, uh, just a review of this process of delisting a product. When you notify us of a delisting, you are, the delisting date is the date you submit that file to us. So we have that load date on the SPL. 
And when you delist it, you change the active or the marketing status from active to completed, and you provide an end marketing date. And we recommend um, that that end marketing date be the expiration date of the last lot produced. Um, that way, and, and so just so you know how the machinery works here, um, even though you have delisted that the status of that product says completed, as long as that date is in the future, that listing will continue to show up on the NDC directory. It will continue to show up um, on uh, in Daily Med. It will continue to show up on the NSDE file, for those of you who use that, um, until that date is reached. And once that date is reached, then it gets closed out here. The, uh, the, the notification or the, me the mechanics here at Daily Med, it gets archived. Um, Actually, NDE just always shows the future date, and then there's no change there. It's just the date it reached. So um, you can delist or, or end market verb um, a drug at any time and provide a future marketing end date. And that way, uh, as soon as you know you've stopped manufacturing, you can delist then, and you don't have to wait two years if something has a long shelf life and then try to remember two years down the road, oh, it's time to delist that bottle of aspirin that we're used to make. Um, when the CMO lists under their own labeler code, can they include JPEG, and this is a review of something we've already talked about, but it bears repeating. Can they include the JPEG of package labels containing PLD's NDC number, or does CMO need JPEGs of labels with their own NDC number? Um, Troy, go ahead. Oh. Oh, so I'll, I guess I'll field that. Um, the answer is the CMO, the, the JPEG on the CMO's listing either it has to have no NDC on it or it should have the CMO's NDC on it. Uh, we, we, uh, we don't want to see, it'll, it'll cause, it causes some confusion when you see uh, on a CMO listing the, uh, the label with the uh, PLD's NDC on it. Um, Again, just running down the list here. We're going to try and get it to as many as we can. I have two packaging configurations. One is a 100-count bottle, and the other is a 100-count bottle in a carton. Do I need to assign a different NDC to both? It's a test for my staff here. Layla, would you like to answer that? You can just nod yes or no. <laughs> So the, the second one is an NDC, uh, is a bottle and a cart? A, ball, a bottle within a carton, the same bottle within a carton. Well, then I would say the bottle gets the same NDC, the carton get a different NDC package code because it's a different NDC package type. Yes. Uh, so as long as you are, so the idea here, as long as you are marketing both those versions, one, uh, the bottle in the carton and a bottle outside of the carton, you should have a different package code for the bottle and for the carton. Um, we talked about that one. Let's, sorry, let's follow, let's go through these. Uh, do you have to input both the primary component label and the carton label, or is the carton label sufficient? So I guess going to our... Uh, our example here in the previous question, if you have the bottle within the carton, do you need both an image of the bottle and an image of the carton? Um, both would be nice. The re the re oh, actually, in full disclosure, only one JPEG is needed, so I would say do the outer carton. Um, but it would be nice to have both. Uh, if a foreign estate, and again, some of these we've talked about and covered, but just they bear repeating, if a foreign establishment is a contract manufacturer for a company that will sell the product in the U.S., the manufacturer is not producing the product under its own name, it's a true contract manufacturer, uh, does the manufacturer need to list the product? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought she would <laughs> say more. Yes. Just like any other, regardless of who's a foreign company, entity, who's a domestic, anytime you've engaged in that. PLD, contract manufacturer relationship, that contract manufacturer is still required to list, register, and list. 
Um, oh, here's a good one I meant to cover earlier. Some API manufacturers list only manufacturer. I should list. It's using some a API manufacturers, and I'll, I'll paraphrase. When they register, only identify themselves as manufacturer rather than API manufacturer. So that when we list our products, if we add that establishment and choose API manufacturer, it will fail validation. If you remember, when we when you add an establishment to a, a drug listing submission and you say this is an API manufacturer, that DUNS number needs to be registered actively as an API manufacturer in order for that SPL to pass validation. If you identify, identify somebody as uh, performing labeling or performing packing or performing as a repacker or such, um, or uh, analysis as a testing lab, that DUNS number has to be an actively registered DUNS number in our registration database under that specific business operation. So um, it says here, is it acceptable for us to list manufacturer um, in order to sort of get the listing in for this DUNS number? Or is it required for the API manufacturer to update their business operations to include API? It is required for that company, that API manufacturer, to get their registration right um, and correct for us. So uh, whoever asked that question, if you can talk to your API manufacturers for us, we would appreciate it. And if they need help changing the registration, let us know. Um, I'm going to do one or two more here, and then I think we'll uh, call it a day. I think we've all had a nice long day here. Um, my company is no longer registered as an, oh, this is a difficult one. My company is no longer registered as an establishment. It was deregistered when manufacturing operations stopped. But products are still listed as active. When we try to retire, delist um, the product, it comes back as an error due to the establishment um, uh, not listing the repack or relabel operation. What needs to be done to avoid the, the error? It's kind of two ways to do this. You can game the system a bit by updating the registration temporarily to include the necessary business operations if that's your facility. Um, in order, you, you get the registration corrected, go delist the products, and then you can change your registration back. Um, uh, for certain cases, we can't do it all the time, depending on you know our workload. Uh, but in, in specific, unusual cases like this, uh, you can also contact our help desk um, again, and this is for any type of situation. Don't feel like any question is too small or too large. We're here to help. But contact us with your situation, and uh, we'll try and figure out the best way to do it. It may not always be the way you want to do it, and it may require a lot more work on your part. But um, it is, you know, it's our job to to help you all get and to get the data right. So, with that, Jeff, do you have any? All right. Power? Well, no, I've got a couple of housekeeping, but before I take care of housekeeping, help me thank Lizette Sujin, panel. And Paul, Paul, I know you've got some closing remarks you want to take.